Harry Dodson picked spikes of larkspur from the cut flower border. Decorating the big house was the responsibility of the head gardener, and while the family was in residence during the summer, fresh flowers were gathered every day. Traditionally, flowers were cut while the dew was still on them, so it meant an early start. The latest the garden staff would start was 7 o'clock, so whoever was doing the decorating was in the mansion by half past 7, and probably even before, and he would be expected to be out of the mansion by half past 9 time. Like the butler and the housekeeper, the head gardener had his own room in the mansion, the flower room. Here, he exchanged his boots for slippers. In there, you would find shelves or cupboards of the vases for different rooms and that sort of thing. And, of course, there was, there was a tap in there and a sink, a wooden sink, naturally, in those days. And you had your other paraphernalia in there of wires and a water can and anything you wanted for flower decorating. I've been asked to make this bowl up with these lovely roses. They are the old Victorian cabbage roses, I call them. But the bowl is shallow. I've spotted outside a box bush, and that is often used. I only need some short pieces here, and I'll place it in nice and tight, almost filling the bowl tight, but not too tight that I can't push the roses in. Modern day, of course, the, the bowl would have been filled with a bit of oasis and, and the job would have been done now. Well, I've been fussing about working out what I'm going to do. The uh, roses are selected and they're pushed around the vase. Uh, they're touching one another, but they're not pressed in. They're allowed to develop, which they will do within an hour or two of being in this bowl of roses. They're now going to be placed in a basket, which will be taken to the room which we're decorating and placed in its position. Glass pedestals were popular with the Victorians. In this shallow crystal dish, pale pink roses and passion flowers are fringed with fern. This lovely little plant is known as pilea. In my young days, they were grown in large numbers. Anywhere where a group of plants was staged or in tubs, anything where a pot needed covering, this was the ideal plant to cover the pots. It came down to the carpet. It was perfect. It had one snag as an house plant. After it had been in a warm room for a few days, the little flowers on it became dry and uh, just the least little touch, then they popped off and it was known to gardeners as the artillery plant. But cheeky journeymen who used to have to go in the mansion and help the foremans and the head gardener to do the decorating uh, used to love to annoy the housemaids and give it a flick. I've done it myself many occasions and it was known to young journeymen as housemaids delight but the housemaids didn't consider it very delightful 
it was quite a problem to, to get those little pieces out of the carpet. Sometimes in my younger days, I used to be rather naughty if, if one of the uh, servants, one of the housemaids was cleaning up or anything. Uh, I would say good morning to her or pass some nicety return and uh, if she wasn't looking or was inattentive, I would put the flowers in her pocket. The ladies' boudoir had also to be decorated each day. Here, only the most delicate and sweet-scented flowers were used. But no flowers were to be found in a gentleman's dressing room. Flowers encouraged indolence, and that, warned a correspondent to the cottage gardener, made the body like Mrs. What's-her-name's tea. So weak it couldn't run up the spout. In the pleasure grounds, the bed of clematis Harry planted earlier in the year has produced a spectacular show, fulfilling its promise of providing a carpet of blue. Elsewhere in the garden, everything's reaching its peak. As the summer sun burns down, conditions become too extreme, even in the stove house. Maintaining a good growing environment requires almost hourly attention. The temperature can be controlled by ventilating and shading, but it's easy to overdo it. Plants need light, and open vents mean a drop in humidity. The feelings that one should have when you came into a tropical oasis like this was a slight feeling that um, you was passing into a bathroom where somebody about 20 minutes or so ago had had a bath in and the atmosphere nice and warm in there and, and yet that warmth had sort of a, a nice dampy warm. When one had seen to the, the watering of the actual plants, then the floors were damp down. That gave the humidity and it gave a nice growing condition. And again, without you being through the mill, uh, you can't really get to grips of what that growing condition is. So you had to watch the temperature and uh, move the top ventilator up as the temperature went up but you never put so much air on that the house became arid and dry and sort of burny in the atmosphere. Next to the stove house, the cooler show house, is home to plants recuperating after a spell in the mansion. Harry deadheads the giant Campanula pyramidalis, or chimney plant. 
It recently graced the front hall. Now it needs some restoration work. I'm making this plant presentable for another use. We've had to take it out of the house because it looks tatty. But if you cut these little dead blooms off, underneath there's another crop of buds to come along and it gives this plant another lease of life. This can be done at least twice to it. It's a job that was given to young journeymen and it was what we termed as a quiet job. It was a, a bit of a Solomon's on the side, actually. But it, uh, it was something well worth doing. They often were used in groups in the front hall and uh, at the end of passages, uh, something that would take the plant with this height. Not all Victorian interiors were as elegant as this. In 1856, Shirley Hibbard published his Rustic Adornments for Homes of Taste, which described all manner of ways of using plants. Ivy was a favourite, trained round mirrors, or used in grander style when it could appear to grow out of the furniture. If they'd wanted to sit in the middle of a shrubbery, you'd have thought they'd have gone into the garden. I like ivy, but some people might find this a bit oppressive. There's one thing we can be certain about. Ivy would have stood the gloom of a Victorian drawing room. As my book tells me, ivy grows well in the shade and may be employed for trailing around sofas and couches. Positions in which its beauty is seen to the best advantage. Well, like it or not, sitting here, you can't escape it. The gladiolus graced many a Victorian room. The gardener's assistant noted that the French florists were among the first to take it in hand. Now English razors have a decided lead. This is the variety hunting song. In the large country houses, rooms were spacious and airy, so flowers and plants survived. It was less easy to keep them going in the towns. The fumes from coal fires and later gas lighting polluted the atmosphere and could be harmful to plants. In 1830, a keen amateur naturalist, Dr Nathaniel Ward, made a chance discovery that was to offer a solution to the problem. At the time, he was studying the life cycle of a moth. Having patiently waited for one of these chaps to pupate before turning into a moth, he took the chrysalis and buried it in a jar which we're told had a close-fitting lid. History doesn't record what happened to the pupa. But Ward reported that, after a time, a speck of vegetation appeared on the surface of the mould and, to my surprise, turned out to be a fern and a grass. He concluded that if a sealed vessel was kept in the light, it could sustain plant life indefinitely. At the Society of Apothecaries, he showed members that water taken up by the roots evaporated through the leaves, condensed and ran down the vessel to re-wet the compost. Ward's discovery had a number of practical applications. Plants now had a greater chance of survival on long sea voyages, safe from the harmful effects of salt spray. In smoky, gas-permeated drawing rooms, whole plant collections could be grown and enjoyed. Here, the simple glazed box became a decorative piece of furniture. It protected not only from pollution, 
but from overzealous maids who flung open windows in the depths of winter. This is one of the very few cases that has survived. It's simple and elegant, but it does have one additional feature, this reservoir. And that was necessary because unlike Dr Ward's original case, this one's not hermetically sealed. And that makes us think that it's a little more recent. Dr Ward's was a closed world, but by the end of the century, a number of clean air measures had improved conditions in London. These allowed elaborate, well-ventilated conservatories and simpler window cases to sprout from the facades of Kensington and Belgravia. This one survived at the former home of punch cartoonist Lindley Sanborn. The window case was an extension of the room and provided a pleasing glimpse of natural greenery from the comfort of one's drawing room chair. And in the largest and most elaborate, they even built an aquarium. But of all the plants used, it was the palm and the tree fern that the Victorians found most majestic. Their statuesque symmetry matched the grandeur of staterooms and entrance halls. But even with such lofty spaces, it was sometimes necessary to reduce their height. Doing this required skill and patience. Lovely old fern, David. It's served lots of useful purposes. It's still very ornamental, but it's unusable as far as we're concerned. Can't possibly take a thing like this to the mansion. We've no staging we can put it up on because we've no further room for it. And uh, we've not got the type of conservatory where we can plant it in the floor and let it grow on, so we're going to try and bring it down to air size and turn it into a useful plant that we can take to the mansion or we can use in here from time to time or take it and use it in other groups. It's a, a method known as Mar Cottage. I've never heard of it. Don't ask me too many questions about it. I still prefer to, to call the method as I've known it for many other subjects uh, layering by approach. But before we get that fur, we've got to start pulling some of this off. This has got to be pulled off. You'll probably need a knife. There's quite a bit to pull away here, but if you pull it down and, uh, and you use the knife to, uh, to work behind it, and then it will go down to the joint from which it originally came. Next, you've got all this fluffy material, which is like the, the airs on a stem. This has to be taken away, taken right down to the little black roots, which you can see below me, are underneath these airs. You can see the little black roots that I've been talking about are, are all coming through and uh, they should be ready to go as soon as we get the pot on. Right. Well, we'll drive a stake in each now. We've got to go 
fairly well back. I should think that's about right if I turn my steak up the right way. I'm at the bottom if you are. I think that's it. Oh, that's lovely. So if we can get that tied in position. That will hold the, the top, which is the piece we require in due course. Now we need a little extra strength to the string here. Otherwise, we'll have it toppling over. There we are. Now we're ready for the next stage. Right. We clear our mess off the top of the pot, make it look gardener like. That's right. Well, it looks as if something's going to happen to it, doesn't it? With the fern secure, the next stage is to make a saw cut halfway through the trunk at a point below the exposed roots. That's right, David. Now the next the last stage, get the pots into position. Mine's firm, yours all right? Now Harry sets about providing conditions which will encourage the roots above the saw cut to develop. That's right, make the pot fit if you can. Yes. We've got half a plant in the back here. Can you Set. hold it at that while I secure it? Yeah. Fingers out of the way. That seems to have got it. And throw my end in there. Now this is the most difficult one of all to do. David, if we can get this around here. That piece of string is to stay where it is. Now right, got it. if you can hold that at that, and I can secure this string, then we can start putting a little tension on these two tail ends, which should hold the bottom of the pot in. Right. There's a good double knot there. I've got mine. And don't move. Hold it so. There's my escape. Well, this is the final string, David, and it should keep the tension on the bottom of our pot. If I put a couple of half itches around that stump, that should keep it all right. That's got that. That should hold it now. Now we're ready to put the compost in. The compost is a, a fibrous loam, a bit of sphagnum moss, a good bit of leaf soil, a bit of charcoal for sweetness, if you can keep the pot steady, while well, I put the base in nice and even. I knew I'd kept the hammer for some purpose. With a suitable compost packed around its trunk, the fern will slowly replace its old root system with a new one. Well, I think that's the niceties taken care of, David. Now, if you pass me the water pot. Yes, this must be kept moist from now on, David. It won't get waterlogged because uh, of the porous nature of the compass, but it must be kept moist. Well, I think that will do now. If you like to pick up the basket, uh, I think we can safely leave it now. The new roots take several months to grow, but when well advanced, the trunk is sawn through. 
cut down to size, the plant's elegant proportions will once more be the centre of attraction. The demands of the house plants have not made Harry neglect the garden. He takes me to see the herbaceous border, which is now at its best. Well, it's a few months since we were here, Harry. It certainly is, isn't it? Looking at this border. Yes, lots have happened since then. This is uh, <laughs> my pride and joy to see this corner do isn't so well that... as it has. It used to be herbaceous, but unfortunately the herbaceous didn't run to planting. No, so it's years. annuals, is it's it? It's annuals. But and they're uh, colourful, aren't they? They are. I, I'm yeah. very pleased with it. It's... And don't they go well against that old wall? Yes, they do. They do fit well with the wall. Well, that's skillful mm -hmm. colour choice. <laughs> yes. Harry. Come and see these lilies, Peter. It's the white form. Yeah, it's the white form of uh, speciosum. Oh, they really are. They're yeah, fine. I like the bit of green in the flower yes, too. Yes, yes, and that, that almost sort of watered effect. Mm. Oh, they're Good they're pot beautiful. plant, good cut flower. Well, it's a grand show of colour and in a difficult year. It's been a difficult year. It's been all we didn't require for for this sort of planting. Well, almost drought from start to finish. Well, it was, yes. Oh, yes, yeah, we yeah, were watering yeah. in right from the very Wait. beginning. Well, because some things do well in the first year, but others, I suppose, have, what, made only a third of the growth? Yes, right? that's all. Like this old miscanthus, you yes, see, it's, it's yes, done nothing. Yes. There's a real pain in the neck. Look at their well, miserable little clump They of always it. said that herbaceous borders were at their best in their second and third year. Yes. Oh, so they were. That was a... the... That was but the ideal. I don't think there's much to complain about here, you know. Oh, well, it's nice to hear uh, you say that. And you've got this old chap to still keep your yeah, eye on he's you. He's still going. No yes. day to bathe, is he? <laughs> he's lovely, isn't he? <laughs> he really is. Yeah.